Good, all right, thank you, thank you. Good energy, good energy. So we're out of the, the honeymoon phase. You know, Labor Day has come and gone. And so, you know, if you kind of look at your schedules, you know, you don't have a break for a while, right? You gotta, you're stuck with me for quite some time now. Uh, but, I mean, hopefully that's, you know, you've gotten your schedules squared away. You have kind of that mindset of when you are going to do everything that you're going to do. You had a problem set that was due this week. Hopefully, you know, not too, you know, problematic for you. But here's how you know that that's going to be fun because as soon as one of them gets due, where are you? There you are. As soon as one of them gets due, you get another one. But I'm going to, before I get to, well, I'll go ahead. So with this version, uh, so problem set two, as you kind of look, that, that image looks eerily similar to what you were dealing with last time, right? This idea that uh, you have a green dot. You or your agent is right there. But you notice there's no dirty tiles. Every tile is gray. Except for one. It's not dirty. It's green. Your job is to design out an agent that can get to the green square. Oh, if you remember last week, A star pathfinding. You're welcome for the pseudocode, right? So build this out. Uh, again, the same kind of concept goes on there. You have uh, nice little kind of uh, sneak peeks of where that green square is on the first five of these environments. Again, the big idea here, uh, if you're thinking about like, oh, I don't know what the other five are, right? The hidden test cases. Well, again, if you implement A star, you're, you've built pathfinding. And what you should see is that, yes, you know, if you're passing all five of these, you're good, right? You're, you, you've got it. So uh, in this kind of light, what I typically say to students, though, is problem set one it was due in a week, right? Not, wasn't, wasn't terrible, wasn't bad, right? Maybe... Maybe a couple hours, maybe three. You know, it was not something that you, you know, it was not meant to be a, you know, thought complex. Or it was not meant to be a thought provoking activity. It was meant to be, hey, learn the infrastructure. Learn that when you build out one of these things or when you have to interact with one of these things, right, there's a specific thing that you need to be working from, right? This action kind of concept. Uh, because as we get into, where are you? I downloaded you, so give me a second. Uh, da, you're here, you're here, you're here, you're here. There. So this time around, you'll notice it follows the exact same format, right? It's got the robot, it's got your environment, it's got your visualized simulation, the same kind of things you were you know, working off of last time, right? Figure out how to get your agent here. That same kind of concept goes on when you're dealing with your test cases. So just like before, right, we ran multiple iterations. This is my way to make sure you're not just doing a random search or something like that. Uh, so again, we're running that same thing, and you have to be successful 70% of the time, right? So again, this is, if you implement A star, you do not have to worry about this, right? So that's the big thing. That's my hint for you. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. Don't go on the Wikipedia and do the, the weird open set, close set, I'm talking to y'all, you know, you won't, but this is more for the people watching at home who didn't watch this lecture. This is me now saying you should have watched this lecture. Uh, no, so again, that's the big kind of point there. Uh, the, the biggest thing I will say for this is with that pseudocode, I'll get to you in a second. Where is that pseudocode? Where's where do I have the red blob there? With that pseudocode, this is your recommendation of finding your path home. You don't have that. That's not in the pseudocode. 
but you do have a data structure that has the pathway back to it. That's how I'm going to leave it. You know, that's where your brain has to work a little bit. Uh, the other thing I'd like to throw out there is you do also have a lecture exercise this week, so I know I'm double, you know, I'm throwing two things at you. One's due in two weeks, one's in, well, one's due in a week and a half, you know, uh, and then the other one is due, uh, I'll give you till Wednesday for this one, give you a full week, but hey, I showed you how to do A star, you're having to program A star, you did it in class, I'm telling you, you got to do it in a midterm that's coming up eventually. Practice. With this, I will also go ahead and throw out there, I don't care about the answer. I know the answer already, right? I wrote this thing. What I care about is, did you follow the algorithm? And why I mean that is because every semester, every semester, someone shoots a message on Piazza or shoots me an email or goes on to office hours. They're like, hey, question blah. I'm not going to tell you which one. Question blah is wrong. I'm like, no, it's not. You didn't follow the algorithm. You cheated your way through it. Not cheated your way through it. You, you gave me the answer rather than the algorithm, right? That's what I'm asking for. I want you to tell me in this kind of thing, where am I considering next? Even if it is not in the different, even if it is not in the final path, right? Think about what we did in class, right? We had to go down one route. Oh, that route turned out to not be so good. We changed routes. I want, I want the part that where the route isn't good enough, right? I, that's what I'm looking for. Um, so be mindful of those. Again, straightforward. Uh, uh, the lecture exercise automatically graded. Problem set, you've got your, your, your time uh, to be working on that. Where are you? Let's see. Yeah, so lecture exercise, I'll give it to you until Wednesday, so right in one week. And then your problem exercise, just to kind of get us back into the square of things, because Labor Day just ruins like the organization, right? Why do I give you a holiday? It ruins everything for me, right? Uh, no, so you don't get as much time. You do get both your weekends. That's, I think, the most important for a lot of you is that you get your two weekends to be working on a lot of these things. If you really, really hate me for you know not giving you full two weeks, only giving you 12 weeks instead of 14 or not 12 weeks, instead of giving you uh, 14 days, I only give you 12, you are free to go on to office hours and berate me. Does that work for you? I will berate back, maybe, I don't know. Uh, questions on any of the assignments before we get into lecture? So... That's where we're going in with sort of today's class. Is a, you know, again, right, think about what I'm presenting to you. I'm showing you a tile-based world where you're doing a 2D, you know, you got to figure out a heuristic, and I showed you, you know, the Manhattan distance and straight line last week and all that, right? That's for your problem set. Then I'm showing you the airport version of that, right, where, oh, you know, here's straight line and everything's a graph. But the problem with both of them, and my, not problem, but the, the limitation of both of those is the fact that they are very explicitly distance-oriented. And what I mean by that is this idea that, you know, again, I have some goal location. I have some star or start location, and it very much is a distance problem between them, right? Even if I kind of draw out that grid, I apologize for the green, I'll throw it away in a second, right? Even if I draw it as a grid, right, the same thing. It's a distance-based problem that doesn't really help us, right? So that's kind of where I want you to have your mind today, is this idea that, well, sometimes I'm not dealing with distance. And if I'm not dealing with distance, how do I develop those heuristic functions, right? Manhattan distance, well, it's distance between two locations. Straight line, distance between two locations. But what if I introduced a different kind of problem? And this one goes back to your childhood or maybe, you know, some of your, your just earlier this years. Uh, 
right? This is known as the sliding puzzle. And the entire idea, again, this is that childhood toy that we all, you know, maybe messed around with. There may be a picture or uh, numbers in my case or letters, right? And the goal is, well, given some starting configuration, what are the steps that I would need to take to put it all in order? Mm. And, you know, if you think about this, this is where, uh, you know, as we can kind of, if you aren't familiar with this, you know, we've got like this blank spot so two could slide down into it or five could slide over or six could or three could, right? That's where the sort of design of these things are. If we look at this problem, you know, no longer thinking about it from a, a, this is a childhood toy example. If we think about it from a mathematical model, a mathematical concept, right? Roughly speaking, that problem, not this specific one, but that problem of like sliding pieces into the right order based on a configuration, on average, you're looking at about 22 steps, right? So again, if we're thinking about this, if we draw this out, Hopefully this one's a little better, right? Doesn't really matter what the, the positioning is for these, but if I have, for example, these branching factors where I have my seven, I have my two, four, uh, five, six, eight, three, one, right? I have four possible moves that I could work off of. I could have uh, two going down, I could have going, uh, five going to the right, I could have six going to the left, or three going up. Each one of them are going to build yeah, their own versions. Of what the next state will be, because it's an action. I've done an action, right? Two is now in the middle, five is in the middle, six is in the middle, three is in the middle, and I won't draw everything. But if I keep on expanding that out and seeing all the possible moves and whatnot, what I should see is a depth of about 22. Okay, and also if you notice, you know, sometimes I have four branching, right? I can have four possible actions, but that's not always the case, right? I've got the, the four branch, but I also have situations where I may only have two allowed moves, right? Only uh, if I'm dealing with a corner in this case, right, there's only something moving to the into it that was adjacent or below it, but above it, like vertically or horizontally. Uh, then in the middle, uh, on these edge pieces, you get a three possible options. So, right, you get two horizontals or one vertical or horizontal. The more important thing is, uh, uh, more specifically, right, you know, four plus two plus three, nine divided by three, three. Branching factor averaging three. That's the part I'm trying to get at. Good, we all accept, yeah? Isn't it, there's only one face that can't four though, right? So there's the rate based on how many places it can be? At that point, we're going too much into the actual math of it versus me just kind of like, Here's a problem. Yeah, that, that, and that's where I'm kind of, okay, average, pie in the sky, like, you know. It may have something more, but at that point, like, I will use the power of accounting and say amortization kicks in, and three is, instead of it being average, it's amortized. Who wants to combat me with amortization? There you go. <laughs> No, so again, as we break this down, though, this is where, again, it's a, it's a tree-like structure. And if it's a tree-like structure and we're doing this kind of pathfinding approach, right, we're still playing off this notion that I want to be able to evaluate a given square. You know, let's arbitrarily say that two down. I want to be able to evaluate this new state against the other possible steps and so that's where I would still find myself running, hey, how many moves did it take me to get here? Plus, how likely am I, how much longer do I have to go, right? That's what we talked about yesterday, or last week. This really hasn't changed. It's one move, one action, right? That part, you're only sliding one thing. 
but the problem is getting to that H, right? This, you know, again, uh, hey, I'll just count this as a one. I, you know, this takes one move, this takes one move, one move, one move, right? That part's easy, but it's the H. Like, what am I, what, what do I do here? And that's kind of, again, this is where I want you to kind of frame your mind for today. Is like, what happens if I'm in problems or spaces that don't have that, that, that intuitive distance, right? What can I do instead to tackle these problems? So the reason for this, right, the reason, the motivation, even if we're just looking at this from a three-by-three three, tiny little example uh, approach is notice, again, well, if I have the amortized three-branching factor and I have 22 moves that I could potentially be doing, that is three to the 22nd power. Or, again, whatever that is, uh, Oh, fine. Right, that is that number. That is, uh, what is that? Uh, thousands, millions, billion. Right? 31 billion? I can't count. Right? 31 billion. Not a big number, but also you understand that that's a lot bigger than, I don't know, how many, you know, places an integer can represent. Right? Oh, suddenly, like, we have a limitation. And that's only on, look how small that problem is. And that's how many possible permutations you'd have to be evaluating. So from a, a computer science perspective, right, you learn this in 316. That makes it infeasible. It makes it too difficult to be working from because we just have too many pieces floating about. And... If I were to just expand this one, right, it's a three by three grid. If I were to go four by four, right, so there are four by four, four times four, 16 minus one to account for the blanks, right? I've got 15 pieces that could be moved, and that's going to turn it into a 10 to the 13th power, right? It just grows in these larger scales as we keep on working through this. So we, what I'm trying to get at here is, even in this tiny little problem that doesn't seem like it would that doesn't seem like it would need something intelligent right a rational agent or whatnot well you can't brute force it or you can try but you know call me in 10 years when it's done is essentially what I'll ask right so how could I form a heuristic how could I I look at this problem and give you some H and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by just sort of providing you with a couple, right? So the first one is this idea of, well, hey, let's just count how many tiles are in the wrong spot, okay? I mean, yeah, see, it seems like a reasonable uh, approach, just, hey, you know, since I know the goal state, is that the goal state? No. Is that the goal state? No. No, 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 no. And what I could produce is now this idea of an H being, or you know, the H of N for a specific thing to be eight, right? Now, if we're looking at my little example here, right? Still no, still, or still no, still no, 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 no. So it would take me one plus the H of eight, nine. Ah, okay, fine. And that's more just like for evaluation purposes. But you can see, hey, in the goal state, oh, well, the H would be zero. So as I got closer, how much further do I have to go? Well, you in theory should see that H is getting smaller as we get there. That's the same as like Seattle uh, is takes zero miles to get from Seattle to Seattle, right? But that's only one. You notice there's the, the, the suffix going on, the suffix, the, that thing, right? I said H1. I said I was going to show you two. The next one I'm going to show you is, hey, rather than just say let's count the, the number of tiles that are in the wrong place, let's take it a step further. 
Well, you remember, again, if we're, we're thinking about what we learned with a star, and again, what you're going to be seeing when you start implementing it, is we don't care about things in the way, right? We only want to really care, again, we want a rough estimation. So in my case, hey, you know, if I'm looking at seven, right, seven's in the wrong spot, and it wants to be where the three is, if we ignore all the stuff in the way, let's just count how many moves would it take for seven to get into its correct spot? One, a two, a three, three, right? So, okay, fine, that's just the seven. And you can see what I'm saying here is I'm not just doing Manhattan distance on seven, to each goal state. And what I kind of mean by that, now that I'm reading my own handwriting, uh, is each one of my tiles, right, they're in the wrong spot. So let me add up how many moves it would take for each one of them to get into their right spot, their goal state spot. Well, if you were to take them, add them all up, you would get, instead of it being eight, you'd get the number 18. Three. One, two, 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 three, three, two. We all okay with adding? Good. I, you know, hey, there's a reason why I do it. It's make sure I do it right. Uh, my point being is, hey, okay, so I've given you like two versions. I've given you this H1. And I've also given you an H2 of N still gives me the one for that G, but now I have an 18. And so I've presented you now with one formulation for F produces a nine. One formulation of F that produces a 19. To wit, you say, okay, okay. Right? I haven't, because I just told you numbers. That's it. I've only, I've only given you numbers. I didn't really tell you which one was better, right? Should, the, should it be smaller or bigger or the same or closer to something, right? That's where, hey, we can't do that. But what I'm going to kind of leave you to now before we get into this is a nice little group activity. Hey, I want you to now do the sliding puzzle, calculate it out. I don't know, maybe the first possible moves as if you were doing a star search. So let's see, uh, I'll give you until 3.32. So I'll give you a nine minutes and we'll come back. <laughs> We are back, everyone. Let me see how you did. Ba, ba, ba. Da, 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 da. Uh, so where are we? Sliding puzzle. Uh, okay, that was all of last class. Here we are. Uh, hi, live stream was faster. But, you know, for the most part, this is the part I care about. Uh, let's see. Let me shrink you down. Yeah, so, okay, all right. But, you know, so be mindful there, right? We're not, you know, again, just because I see it. You know, double checking, hey, I, I only need it to be in one extra spot. I only need it to slide once. It's not that I need two things to slide. It's one only needs one. Um, but for the most part, other than that, you know, it seems like everyone's getting those. If you need a little, you know, uh, uh, explanation on those, let me know. I'm more than happy to kind of walk you through them. Uh, let's see, those are all the Manhattan distances. And then we start getting into the H's. And this is where... You can see, where are you? What's the H for the starting position? Well, I just showed you one move that I need to do. Where's my blue? There's my blue, right? One needs to move, two needs to move, five needs to move. And so my H in this case should be three. Hey, I have a, a three moves 
that need to happen, or each one of the tiles that do, do need to move would take one move each, AKA three. Um, and that's where you can kind of see, again, most people have uh, that part down. But then when, as we're, bleh, as we're getting to those actions though, this is where, uh, for the most part, you know, some of you have it right, some of you have it off, you know, this is, but this is more like why I kind of present this. It seems like a lot of people, you forgot about, remember I was asking for F score, right? So that's the H plus the G, right? G takes one move each. All right, well, how many does this need? This needs one, two, two, three. This would need one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Nope, that's. So just being, you know, that's my way of kind of saying, hey, if you're, you're seeing your number and your entry does not correspond to kind of what I was presenting over here, Again, right, this is a learning. It just means that we're, we're learning, right? So in that kind of sense, right, you know, be mindful of those different little things when you're trying to tally things up uh, when it comes to, like, your lecture exercise, right? Because uh, that'll be very important, especially since you have to do it manually as well. Okay. Now, now that we've had our, our a little fun, we, we return back to a major issue. I showed you two, right? I just made you do Manhattan distance. Is it, oh, you have to do Manhattan distance? That Manhattan distance is better? Well, I mean, I, I really haven't kind of said which one is better. I just, again, gave you one of the approaches. And so that's actually kind of the next question is like, well, how do I choose between them? I thought up, I thought up two different heuristics, two different approaches, which one is the better one? Now. From your text, right, these two examples, you know, the misplaced versus Manhattan, uh, you know, the, the Russell Norvig book kind of actually did this, right? They took it across 1,200 different problems, and wouldn't you know it, H2, the Manhattan distance version, was always superior to H1, the number of misplaced approaches. And, well, guess what? That's a way to solve this. The question, right? Not just solve the problem, but like, hey, which one of my heuristics is going to be better? I, you build one for like a, a different problem, right? How do you know it's better than Manhattan distance? Or do you just only do Manhattan, right? What do you, well, you know, again, if I built two heuristics, I just run it on both. Run the problem on both. And in fact, that is research, right? That's, that is a lot of our, our modern AI research is like, hey, I do a different model, right? They, they, they talk about it with models instead of heuristics a lot of times. But like, hey, I have a different policy. Let me just do the same thing and compare to like a different policy, which I also do the same thing to. Which one performed better, right? That's how we know when models are better or worse and whatnot. So, Yes, it's, this is where it seems odd if it's the first time you're seeing this of like, here's I am being like, yeah, brute force it. Well, what I'm telling you to brute force is not the solution. It's the heuristics. It's your methodologies, right? That's kind of one approach. There's probably some mathematical proof ways for it, but I will definitely act, uh, uh, say I'm going to do this one instead. I'm not, I'm not the best there. Uh, but again, if we're kind of looking through and, you know, again, how do you prove? Well, again, this is what uh, a lot of our research in a lot of these traditional algorithms and problems is, is, all right, how do they all compare against all your different algorithms uh, that we can do? And in fact, you can see, hey, you know, if we were to start expanding the dimensions of the sliding puzzle problem, right, breadth first search, uh, breadth First search, it would take 122 moves on average to solve them. But you can see as we just slowly keep increasing, it gets ugly pretty quickly. Well, then how does that compare to now running a star on the problem? And specifically, a star 
where we use heuristic one versus A star where we use heuristic two. And this is kind of why, again, it's you test it out and just grow it to scale, right? Notice, number of moves. Yeah, that's 19 is smaller than 24, but, right, that seems nominal, right? Okay, it just took, it could have been a little, it, it was performing better, but, you know, not by a lot. But as we go to scale, notice what starts to happen, right? It even starts to hit very early on when we just hit uh, 10 dimensions, right? Suddenly, right, that's already growing. And as we keep on expanding, by the end of this, notice, it's an order of magnitude higher to do the misplaced tile version. To do this version will take you 10 times more moves to solve it. Right, that's your scale. That's, that's your big O problems kind of stuff happening. So we can tell the heuristic is more successful or better in comparison to H1 through testing it. This is, again, this is how I'm technically evaluating your models. Right? I give you the space, and then I'm just, let me run it on different uh, maps to see how well it performs. Uh, but, okay, fine, right? You know, this is where, so you have to write code and then delete it afterwards? That's one approach. Or, well, you know, if your, your H's, right, again, if this is acceptable or, again, what we were calling admissible, right? Admissible just means not overestimating. I mean, it's giving you a ballpark. Uh, it, I don't remember. Yes. Yavin. Yavin, how long? It is 3.40 right now. What time do you expect to get home today? Maybe about 9.30. 9.30, so if it's about 3.40. How much time? 9.30. Well, ballpark, that's six hours, right? Right. Okay, so, you know, for you to get from this location to home, six hours, ballpark estimation, could be right, could be wrong, you, you know, might just go home right now, right? Ballpark, it's right there, you know. If I were to say at the very, at, it will take at least 10 minutes for you to get home. Am I technically correct? Yeah, least, at least, remember, at least just means the lower bound, right? Okay, that's, not really helpful because it's too low. You would much rather me kind of make an estimation of six hours, right? Oh, you know, ballpark, six hours, you'll be home kind of thing. Suddenly, well, does that mean I throw out the 10-minute the one? No. Uh, yeah, I know it, it, it seems low for our sake and not close to our solution, but... Rather than deleting these old heuristics, another approach you can do, max. You have all of these calculations. These calculations are not, you know, computationally expensive ones, right? The H, count how many tiles, all right? They're, you know, it's however many tiles you had wrong. Manhattan distance. It's a O of one calculation. You just do it on the number of tiles. So these are not, you know, mathematically, con you know, expensive. So just keep them. And then take whatever the biggest one is. Because, again, remember, the biggest thing is as long as we're not overestimating, we're good. I keep saying that. So we're going to have to explain overestimating. You have, all, yeah, you have all watched The Price is Right, Correct. I see some nods, and then I see some shaking of heads, at which point I say, if you have not seen this, buy a television, get cable, right? Because it's only a cable. You're not watching it online. Uh, get cable, get sick one day, and then sit and watch The Price is Right uh, at 10 a.m. Like, 
any other you know, public school kid did. Okay? Good. Anyways, right? Okay, fine. Price is right. Well, the entire idea is, again, this is the opening of the, the game uh, where you know, the contestants are trying to decide if they get to be on stage, right? So the object of this part of the game is guess, get closest to the actual retail price of some wash dryer or something like that without going over. That's the important part. If you go over, you can't do it. But for our sake, we're going to act like our version of uh, the price is right. None of them are going to go over, right? They just, they, don't, they won't uh, because they're all good admissible heuristics. Well, again, the entire idea, if you notice what I was saying, right? Let me change colors. Let me, I'll go purple. No, I'll go black. If I use max... H1, H2, right? Again, think of this like it's code. Uh, those are just two numbers. One of them is going to be the bigger number. I pick the bigger number, right? Well, again, my whole point here is I'm trying to get as close to that value that I'm seeking as possible. So in that situation, the bigger thing is I'm just trying not to overestimate. Technically, right, the 10-minute mark that H1, that doesn't give me a, a big number, think about it when it's in the price is right rule. Why do you do that? Well, if you're assuming that everyone else overestimated, it's your baseline. It's like, hey, you know, I don't need to try any harder, right? So technically, yeah, it's still admissible in that context. Every product will be at least $1. You know, you're just play, rolling the dice of whether or not it's a good one uh, for in this game show kind of context. If, however, you know, you get closest to the, the actual price, let's arbitrarily say it was uh, $830. I know he looks sad and, and she looks happy, but work with me here, right? Let's say, our, you know, if you're at 830 and I'm able to make an estimation that it'll cost 825 feet, steps, dollars to get to the goal... I've gotten very close, therefore you win, right? That's the more important thing uh, that we're kind of trying to deal with. So, yes, in their kind of, in the game show land, when we deal with humans, humans are really bad at, uh, you know, being a, an admissible heuristic, but that's why we build mathematical equations to do it for us, because they, they, they aren't bad. Questions on mathematical equations being smarter than us? So, okay, how do I create a heuristic? I gave you Manhattan distance. I gave you number of misplaced houses. I gave you straight line. Okay, you know, how are you, you going to take that out into the real world when you're not dealing with tile-based environments or airports and all that stuff? Like, how am I going to get to use a heuristic? Well, what you typically do is you look at your problem and you establish and you, you sit down and you think about it and you go, what are the rules of my problem? And if we make this sound much more scientific, mathematical, or academic, what are the... the constraints of my problem. And we'll see that when we get into constraint-based uh, uh, solvers uh, in a little bit. Uh, but again, what are the rules to my problem? Because if I establish what the rules are, well, the rules are just guidelines. What if I just get rid of some of the rules? That's what we call a relaxed problem. Why we do that is technically that can give us estimations. Right, because oh, you know, I can't walk through this thing, so therefore, you know, my, you know, I have to abide by the rules of physics. So I have to calculate all the the math going on with physics suddenly. Right? No, just let me walk through this thing. Right? It's all meant to be like just thought experiments. Let me walk through this thing and ignore this whole I got to go around it process. That's a relaxed rule. So if we think about the sliding puzzle problem, 
And I, for my sake, I'm only just showing you one, you know, you know, the rest is there. But if we're thinking about what it means for the sliding puzzle to move, well, a tile is allowed to move if two rules or two constraints are met. One, the adjacent or the, the tile that, you know, our A or two is moving towards is adjacent, right? Either vertically or horizontally, but it's adjacent, right? That's rule one. Rule two, that location has to be empty, available for placement, right? That's, those are the rules of the game. The rest is like, I just told you, a goal state. That's, that's not really a rule. That's more of a goal, right? So, okay, fine. Well, what if I get rid of some of the rules? What if I got rid of, hey, B has to be blank? You know, again, I'm not trying to cheat in the game. I'm just saying when I'm trying to make and create something like a heuristic, uh, let me just drop some of the rules because that, you know, that way I don't have to mathematically try and represent them. And so, hey, you know, as long as they're adjacent, two can move to that location or whatever the, the tile is, right? Uh, perfectly fine, right? That, that could technically work. Doesn't matter if there's something in there, right? Well, what if we flipped it the other way? Oh, the only rule is that the target location is blank, right? That's another possible you know, one. Hey, you know, it doesn't have to be adjacent. So two could technically move here, right? It, it could move diagonal. Nothing's stopping me, again, from saying that. Again, these are just like relax, relaxations of the actual problem, right? But hey, I've produced a new relaxed problem where, you know, the tile can move as long as B is blank. Right? Well, if I've removed one and I remove the other, what's the natural next one? Remove them both. Boom. Tile A can move to tile B, period, right? Again, don't think about it like it's an actual, you know, sliding puzzle because that's not a fun puzzle, right? That's nothing. But that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to, again, find things that we could turn into heuristics. Maybe I can transform this into a heuristic. Maybe I can transform this into a heuristic. Maybe I can transform this into a heuristic. And in fact... That's technically what I've been showing you all of today. That first one where, hey, as long as B is adjacent, it doesn't matter if uh, B is filled, right? Remember, that's Manhattan distance. That's what I've been talking about with Manhattan distance this entire time. Oh, let's ignore walls. Let's ignore things that are in our way for the purpose of making our estimate. So removing that B has to be empty. I was doing here at Manhattan. So we were doing it uh, in this case. What about that bottom one? Well, technically, hey, you know, as long as uh, uh, A can move to B and A is just allowed to move to B, period, eight misplaced tiles, right? There's no rules, there's no sliding. This is the bare minimum. If, Notice how as I re removed a lot of the rules, all the rules, right, I'm getting, I won't call it, I'll call, I don't want to call it like subpar, but like I'm getting this version. I'm getting the one that has a lower estimate of how much further to go because it's a little too relaxed versus the one that only had some of the rules removed, right? Suddenly I have a heuristic that can work that way. Technically this middle one, you know, if you thought about it hard enough, uh, that as long as A is, uh, or B is blank, okay, well, you know, we're not really trying to uh, eyeball it, uh, or not eyeball it, we're, we're not really trying to physically, like, take a screwdriver into the two and put it into the two slot. You could eyeball it and say that's kind of like straight line distance. Yeah. It's zero. If it's not there, the space is blank. It's one. If it's not there, the space is blank. It's two. Because if there's, if there is, the space is trying to go to, it's occupied. That tile has to move to a, a blank space, and then the other one can move to it. 
So the question, or the, the question was sort of presenting an alternative heuristic. Uh, I, I won't say it's the same, but I do like, like it's an alternative heuristic. I would call it an H, uh, so I've done an H1, an H2, an H3 technically. I would call that like an H4, where it's like, oh, if you're in the wrong, if you're in the right spot, zero. If you're in the wrong spot, one. If something is in your spot, two moves have to happen, at least two moves. Yeah, I could, I would kind of fit that slightly here, but a little bit more. Um, it would be, yeah, it would be somewhere, it, that would be somewhere in between these two. So yeah, um, yeah. And how would you test it? Well, you'd build it and then see how it compares. Um, you can do a lot of them. And in fact, that's where I'm going to let you have a little fun. Another group activity for you. Wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. Uh, I'll give you, I'll give you four, oh, I'll give you, I'll give you six minutes. So 401 will come back. But what are the rules to Sudoku? If you don't know how to play Sudoku, make a friend. And we are back. Let me see how you did. Where are we? There we are. All right. Rules of Sudoku. Rules of Sudoku. That's all last week's or last classes. There we are. So, yeah, for the most part, uh, let's see. We got, uh, looks like left to right, that, that's row, row, row. So, you know, for the most part, it looks like most people got, you know, a, you know even went the same as a, uh, one number row wise, someone else put a, where's that column? One digit per column, that's fine. Again, rules are not meant to like have an order to them, but for the most part, yeah, I think everyone's got sort of the idea, up, downs, boxes. Uh, anyone say quadrant? Cause they're not quadrants. Did anyone say quad? I would say try a little, do, yeah, try and do a little harder. You've got one here that was for, that's too many rules. That's not a rule. Uh, so what I'll kind of present here, this is mostly just like a, hey, remember, you know, there's human rule kind of explanation where you can kind of lump everything to get, you know, together, but then mathematically, and this is something you're going to see uh, uh, when we get into constraint-based programming as well, is like, well, no, you, you can't, you got to explicitly state each one of your constraints. Think like a conditional statement, right? You can't do... Uh, x equals 5 or 6, right? You have to turn it into x equals 5 or x equals 6, right? We have to make them explicit. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, I think that's all, you know, and then I just kind of keep listing until you, you run out of spaces. You can't cross out any of the numbers already there. Fair enough. I like that one, especially if you're thinking about it from a rules, uh, a relaxing rule perspective. Hey, Let's just forget that a number is in a certain spot, right? That might actually help, right? If you, you know, you violate the rule of uh, fixed starting points. Maybe that works. I don't know. That's, that's really, I will put it like this. If you choose to do it, let me know, uh, and then I'll, I'll force you to write a paper and take all the credit for your work. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. My point being, anyways, what I'll kind of shift gears for the, the remainder of the, the lecture before I send you on your way is there's also different approaches that you can also take. And this kind of gets a little bit back to what we were talking about with that idea of bi-directional search, right? Technically, you can still have the heuristics and whatnot, but if I'm looking for relaxing uh, ways to relax my problems, one approach could be Let's not even worry about all of the possible, you know, things I'm moving, right? Again, the sliding puzzle, there are eight pieces. What if I don't care about some of those pieces? Why? Well, if I can get to this goal state right here, if I can get to this spot, 
I don't care where these are. I might have a solution to get to the actual goal, right? The, you know, this five, six, seven, eight, they could be in any order, but I know what to do from here. Great example. Once again, I always like to ask the question, who thinks it can beat me in chess? Who plays chess? What if I told you I really am not that good at chess? <laughs> oh, oh, wow. <laughs> Suddenly a lot of people are like, all right, I need to raise my ELO score, right? No, my point being, right, I don't, you know, you may have gambits that you work off of when you're playing chess, where it's like, oh, I already know my opening. I know the first five moves that I always do, right? That's congratulations, right? That's technically what we're doing here with a pattern database. In fact, I can go ahead and give you a little, you know, history lesson uh, about when I was in your shoes once upon a time when the hair was down instead of up. When I was in your AI shoes, I was in a competitive AI programming tournament. And the winner of said tournament, I don't want to spoil it because it's your problem set four, but the winner of said problem set four tournament just did this. Hey, if I can get to a cert if I can get to a certain configuration, I know the solutions to guarantee I always win. And guess what? They won. Right? So, you know, this is a way you can relax your problem by not trying to get all your configurations or not search for all your configurations. Maybe search for a, a fragment of them and then, yeah, you know, just either have that be a separate sub-problem or it is technically a little bit of brute forcing, but, you know, it works, right? That, again, at the end of the day, you want best outcome. You don't want thinking humanly. We want acting rationally, right? We want best possible outcomes. So this approach technically, yeah, technically can also work. Um, and again, this is where you can work backwards through your space uh, to, you know, hey, how do I get these sub-goal states, right? Uh, and I'll go ahead and say, you know, some of that will lead into when we get to planning much later in the semester, right? You know your goal. Well, how do I get there? Right? That's you, so you start taking steps back, working backwards from it to identify, oh, well, before I get to the goal, I have to get to this sort of state, this status here. Well, before I can get to my goal goal, if I can just get to here, whatever here happens to be, again, I know the answer from here. Right? I have it programmed uh, versus thought uh, through, and so that also will work. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can make that same space. So the last kind of thing I'll kind of present is now a little thought experiment. This is, these are the questions for, you know, it's going to be the weekend soon, right? You're all going to do the college thing and go to bed early and not, you know, gallivant at night uh, in the dark and whatever, right? But should you choose to gallivant, you know, and it, it turns out to be 3 a.m., and you're with your friends, and you're just tired. You haven't consumed anything at all. Here's an opening. Here's a nice little question for you all to have at 3 a.m. Do you think it's possible for a computer to look at a problem and design out a heuristic? Right? And this is, again, these are open questions. These are not meant to be a yes-no question, right? Can it? Could it do a good heuristic, right, versus a just not great heuristic? How does it, you know, like, what would it, how would it even do this, right? That is op some open thoughts, and, you know, that's technically what uh, leads into learning with experience. We are still in the traditional AI model when we're not talking about machine learning yet or reinforcement learning yet. We haven't got there yet, but we know it exists. It's not like it, it doesn't exist. So maybe for it to figure out a good heuristic, we have to show it a bunch of bad heuristics, or it has to generate a lot of bad experience or bad uh, heuristics to produce experience, at which point then maybe some heuristic could be produced. And in fact, 
you know, hey, if we keep on playing and spitballing this idea, you know, we were talking about this idea of the heuristics. Well, what if I did? Instead of it doing, instead of uh, doing the, the max H1, because again, this is just math equations that you program, right? These are things that you can work off of. What if instead of that, I changed it? What if I, you know, hey, these turned into polynomials all of a sudden, right? These are some value. I don't know what they are. And then there's some coefficient to my polynomial. There's some number here. And I could maybe, you know, since I can't change this, because this is going to be, a, you know, a calculated value at the end of the day, right? This H is a math equation. Maybe this C, this coefficient that I've just tacked on, maybe that can change. Maybe that has some flexibility to it. And in fact, you might notice, well, hey, that looks eerily similar. That just seems like another math equation that H1 and H2 could do. And what's really interesting about this design, if you were to dig a little deeper, this is machine learning. This right here, this math equation, this is getting us into those chapters, you know, of machine learning from your text and what we will see. And in fact, here's your spoiler, or, you know, here's your teaser, right? You could think of a neural network as a heuristic, right? Here's your H's. Here's all your inputs, right? Here's your calculated values. Then you've got some coefficient that you can change. I can't change the X's, right? Those are the, the inputs. Those are fixed in place. But I can fiddle with this W. I can fiddle with this C maybe, right? Because it's not calculated. And oh, I mean, then there's enough of the other stuff we'll talk about, you know, when we get to neural networks. But look at that. You know, technically. You can make this argument. I'm making this argument. Who wants to debate me? Good. Because unless there's any questions, uh, I said unless there's any questions, I see where I am. I got three minutes. I'll hold you for the three. Any questions? Yes. So if you overestimate, uh, the big idea uh, working to the, the getting to the house analogy, uh, it, you know, it'll take you at least three days to get home. Well, if I make that to every kind of one of my options, they're all just like bad suddenly. I've, I've, none of them are going to get me to my pathway because they've all over, that's that overestimation. Correct. All righty, get on out of here. Have a wonderful weekend. I will see you next week.